to be a weirdo. And so I went for a background that was very weirdo centric and I took the um the far traveler background from the skag. And then the skag lists a bunch of potential places you can be from. So I rolled that and I got Mulharond. So my character is from a desert setting. I've decided in whatever this fictional setting you're creating. Is yeah, Mo- well, Mulharond is uh, <clears throat> is like Egypt in Forgotten Realms. In fact, I think they're actually yeah, I just thought about that literally from t- Egypt. Yeah. I, you, I just thought about that as you were talking about the um, <clears throat> about your stopover in Dubai. Yeah, I had that character from Mulharond, uh, Ron Shadaz, who was in a Charlie's campaign. <laughs> I a bunch of those, you know. Is that like the that. one who was trolling pancakes the whole time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. convinced and him was, he um, was a high priest. Yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was a, a rogue charlatan, but I told everybody I was a cleric, and I would pretend to do like cleric stuff. It was great. <laughs> this is why I don't play often. I think. I think. I think it would break most people. I like, rolled I would... up nothing but trauma for this character. Like I was rolling personality traits, and then I rolled a couple of things in Zans, and I'm like, oh my mm-hmm. god, why do all my characters have to suffer so much? <laughs> I know, and you know it's going to be one of my campaigns, so there's always going to be something that's... Right? Like... So, like, today, when you were, like, like when that guard was messing with us, my flaw was, I don't take kindly to some of the actions and motivations of the people of this land, because these folk are different from me. Yeah. And my bond is, my freedom is my most precious possession. I'll never let anyone take it from me again. And so this guard, like, this, like, like older teenager, is like, mm, I'm going to take you all to jail. And I'm like, <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> that was fun you know i i, I rolled i, I kind of had an idea like i knew i wanted to do sword and sorcery and hey everybody we're just oh, we're they're just asking dead. about your beard dave he shaved it <laughs> don't look at me don't. i mean, we actually I joke about it in the in the company okay. most of the guys in the company have beards i shave mine off regularly like this is too much <clears throat> And I don't like beards, so Jen's always teasing me. Yeah, it was getting, it was getting a little crazy. Like, I wasn't having to use like my hands or fork to eat food anymore. It was just kind of like doing it for me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did actually fix the sheet, Eric. I don't know if it just wasn't linked properly on the locations we have it for you guys. That's our bad because we did fix it before we set it up this week. <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah, that was fun, though. Um, if you guys have been following the world building series, we ran a uh, first adventure set in that world, the one I've been building out on YouTube. So It's it dark! Is... Oh my god! <laughs> well, I just rolled for it in the campaign settings, and I also want to do sword and sorcery, which is not that dark. I mean, there was like a, a, a an ogre that couldn't count, so, you know. That's that was true. charming, right? Man, that's all I learned from the first session was we're going to have to become friends with traditional monsters because almost every human we ran into was just so awful to us. <laughs> yeah, but that's every camp scenario. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I just, I just like, I thought it was funny, kind of, because I was like, I wanted to do like a, like, when I say dot, like mostly human, it's not even like Forgotten Realms where it's like 80 20. I was like, this is like 99.1. <laughs> and here's this like cod party of nothing but weirdos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, do, 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 do. And it's just like, like, oh, this will be fun. So, yeah, it was weird. Like, when I, I mean, I've been basically random rolling everything. And uh, yeah. Did you like that side? Did you like it? I enjoyed the first session. I think first sessions are really difficult all the time. I think it helped that there was a lot of experience at the table. So Oh yeah, it's like everybody there's like a pro DM. Some useful stuff. <laughs> and it, yeah. was, it was interesting. Like I enjoyed running with Ty. I also enjoyed running with TJ. I like I was a little bit familiar with Charlie and Pancakes because I'd listened to some of their play before, so uh-huh. I wasn't totally unfamiliar. I mean, Magnus. I've played, like, almost a full year of games of Magnus at this point. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've, you're all Magnus now. Uh, we love Magnus, so. We love him. He's our favorite. Oh, Magnus. <clears throat> March 17th is coming up. That's my three-year anniversary of 5th edition. Oh. oh. Congratulations. 
right. Yep. I got, I was just looking at the episodes I had scheduled. I need to schedule the new one. I didn't upload it yet. I did one today right before this session. <clears throat> and I guess we got. I stopped um, watching your new ones because I realized I was going to end up spoiled. Yeah. We'll do um uh, another one on Saturday. Sharper, that's actually a really good question. Or Sharp Barad. Uh, they asked us, uh, do you find DMs make for good players? <laughs> I don't, don't ever have think, any entertainment. <laughs> I don't think it's an it's a an obvious yes or no, but I have found that for people who just started playing in fifth edition, uh the people who are willing to DM are often better players for me because they have a lot of empathy for what the DM is dealing with on their side of the board and can help <clears throat> I, some of them have the capacity to help the DM at the table. Like I backseat mm -hmm. DM all of Ducky's games. By basically running all of our technical stuff because Ducky yeah. doesn't remember it as much as I do. I'm 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 a terrible rules lawyer. Like I don't even try to be, but like something will happen. I'm like, mm, you can't do that. <laughs> like, oh, do you have a? It's like I'd like to cast identify. Do you have a hundred GP pearl? Then he ain't casting shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. But yeah, and hey, by the way, Eric, uh, I'm in my 30s still, bro. So, back <laughs> Richard asked us what's the not on actual work, but you can DM skill. Actual work, it was on 40. So, so they're run by the they're managed by the same company, I believe, or at least they yeah, operate on similar software. Uh, I, DM skill is owned by Wizards of the Coast, and they have different ownership rules that allow you to use the full IP within uh, their allotment. There are specific rules in that. It's not a, f a free for all because I don't, I know for sure you can't use yeah, something. It's, well, the, the company's name is One Bookshelf. So if you ever buy anything from them, that's who the, it could be One Bookshelf LLC. And it's its own entity, but it's mostly like, you know, Wizards is like they're the guy shaking down like, hey, where's my cut? You know, come on, pal. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much how it goes. But they also, I mean, they own drive through RPG cards. Yeah, they were asking cards, us the like... difference between DM Skilled and drive through RPG. Uh, drive through RPG, you can put more, you have to, you can't use all of Wizards IP on drive through RPG. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck within the open gaming license there. Yeah, it really, like, <clears throat> like the big thing is that when you start out, there's a really useful table actually on wizards.com. Like, what kind of content do you want to create? If you want to do this, do drive through. Um, do DM scale. If you want to do this, do something else. And pretty much, if you want to write something that's in like Forgotten Realms or Red and Loft or Eberron or whatever other official, um, you know, Magic the Gathering inspired lands there are now, it has to be on DM's Guild. But you get full access to everything. You get all the monsters and all the roles and blah 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 blah. And it, you know, it's very it's very specific. The trade off is they take half and they own it. Like there's no like like. Oh, I'm just letting them borrow my stuff. It's like, no, it's theirs. It becomes theirs. They can do whatever they want with it at that point. Um, drive through is a little bit looser. I think they only take 25%. And um, you can either have them officially own it outright, or you can have a deal where they don't own it outright, but they don't promote you as much if they don't own it outright. So that's kind of the catch there. Um, both are really great for people starting out, especially if you're a quality writer, because... Um, there's a lot on there that's not quality. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to knock anybody on there who's trying and, you know, hustling. But, you know, it's it's definitely like, you know, hit or miss in terms of quality. <laughs> so am I. But, hey, you know. Um, <laughs> hey, damn it, Sarge. You're, not, you're supposed to. I'm, gonna no. <laughs> I'm back. You know what, Sarge, for that. I will say it has been. <laughs> Like it's so weird looking at our content. You can almost see like the hard line of when you went full time and had help with the content <laughs> because it's a completely different. You can also see when when roll twenty when we started moving on roll twenty because that's when we really committed to location based adventures for a while because we had to deal with digital assets. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find the link Dave was talking about. Uh, I think it's just. Just on their OGL page. I'm 
bum, 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 bum. Yeah, Legal funny. information. There you go. Like, again, y'all, we are not we are not uh, lawyers. If you have questions regarding the open gaming license and the standard reference document and the rules of various distribution channels, you should refer to the information given on those channels. And if you don't understand then, please contact your own people qualified to give advice for that. And yes, Roxanne, it does have six fingers. It is the first trinket in the two <laughs> mummified goblin hand with six fingers. Roxanne, please don't feed him. <laughs> ah! Ah! Um, yeah, and I also have a piece of moonstone. It doesn't glow when the moon's full, but I almost had the journal written in a language that I don't understand. I had like this Russian journal from the 20s I was going to buy on eBay, and it was like I was getting away with it too. It was like it was gonna be like three bucks for shipping. I'm like, yes. And then somebody like sniped it in the end. I'm like, because it looks so cool. I'm like, oh man, it's so rad. It's probably just it's like people the... complaining about Karl Marx and stuff. Like, mm, I hate that Karl Marx. <laughs> Jordan asked me how many times I had to give that spiel. I give it a lot because, like, in my in my regular life away from DM Dave, I'm also a notary public, so I often have to distinguish what I can and can't do in my other profession. So, yeah, I've it's sold something insurance. you get used to doing. So, I sold insurance. We have to say the same thing when we did insurance. Like, I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> dot dot dot. <laughs> I'm not an accountant, but <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, we'll be starting in two minutes. Yeah, uh, well, Dana, it's, it's 400 pages of SRD OGL, but if you look at the resource document I gave, which has this link on it, it will also give you a link to, S, like, websites are a little bit more UX friendly than, like, a giant document. Um, and you can, like, sort through it. And Donjon, too. Donjon's a really easy way to look for it, because all you do is sort through Donjon, click it. If it says not in the SRD, you're like, oh, well, there it is. Uh, yeah, like I'll be straight up with you guys. Like we use a lot of other sites when we're using the SRD in general. But whenever there is an uncertainty for us, I just open up the original document and I'll search for the yeah, just do a item or the item or creature we're concerned about and verify. Yeah. At this point we between me, Sarge, and Laura, we have most of them memorized. Um like uh and then like Griff too. Griff probably knows magic items better than we do. Griffin, like sometimes I get man, sometimes Griffin I get mad knows about it. a lot of the SRD. It's kind of wild sometimes when I'll bring something up to him. He'd be like, it's he's, not SRD, Sarge. He's <laughs> even more like I we're pretty good about it. Like it's kind of like it's like this. Um when I used to bartend, we always worried about our ABC license. And even though it was unlikely that we were ever gonna have an issue. Um, we figured, hey, it's better to be on the right, you know, the right side of the uh, legal contract than it is to try to like push the envelope, right? So it, it's not worth a few extra sales just to do that. And it's the same thing with the OGL. It's like there's a bunch of gray areas. Like, can Wizards of the Coast really say Banshees like like are theirs? It's like no, they can't. But you know, you just suck it up and you make something that's exactly like it, <laughs> and you just keep on rolling. Ah, it's just a scream. It's just a screamy ghost. Oh, look out for that screamy ghost. I'm just screamy ghost gonna scream at you. <laughs> screamy ghost. <laughs> oh, that's, Jesus. That's what a professional content creator looks like, you guys. <laughs> nah, Rick, I was in uh, Virginia when we had that. In Oklahoma, I don't even know what their laws are. I served it up in 2011, so it wasn't important. Sarge, I'm a... Oh, come on, Sarge. Damn it. All right. All right, guys, we're going to... We, 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 we know this is a long one, so we got to make sure we jump yeah. in to do this stuff. <laughs> How to write... I almost want music. How to write Table Adventures for Tabletop RPGs Part 3. Like Timothy three... shows up with his horn. Doo -doo. Oh. Doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> Between each slide. Oh, look. We have a lot of Anyways. inside jokes. I'm sorry, guys. Hi. Yeah, Dungeons. Dungeons old word. That is one thing you will learn from doing... I need to turn off check because it'll distract me, but that is one thing you'll learn from writing Dungeons and Dragons full-time is you know so many useless words that can only be used in the format of Dungeons and Dragons. Like, uh, it happened with your Word of the Day calendar a lot. Uh, uh, today is obations. 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 That's the word of the day. So, mm -hmm. 
Today's all going to be about actually writing the module and um, the it, it is technical, but it's not like last week where it was like, you know, a whole lot of uh, getting fire hose of arithmetic. This is going to be a little bit more about um, the writing side of D&D and how to organize information in a meaningful way. Um, fiction writing. I must say technical. before we jump in on this, we're going to get a lot of questions about the slides. The slides are available on the resource sheet. I will pin it here after I'm finished speaking. Yep. And a lot of the content we're going to be talking about today is not exactly found in the DMG as like no. the last two weeks. So if you are having a hard time because we're going to be moving fast, you will have access to the slides on our resource sheet. Yeah. And really, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. I've I've been a professional writer for a long time. And even though I don't have a, a formal college degree, I did get an associate. Well, 95 percent of an associates. Um, then I had a kid, so I couldn't do, take my last chemistry class so that's the only reason i don't have an associate's degree <laughs> uh because i had to be that person but we um the, the a lot of this they don't really teach you in much unless you're like in a journalism major or um you know uh if you're a search engine optimization professional so um a lot of it has to do with information architecture which is a it's just kind of a fancy way of saying like how you organize things so it's easier to read so the this is why the first slide is fiction writing versus technical writing and this is really important because we we find this i don't know like sarge's opinion on this but i think this is the number one thing that some people have trouble understanding when they first start writing out adventures is that adventure writing does have elements of fiction writing in it in other words you know there's fantastical elements and stuff like that and you are telling a story but it, it is mostly technical writing because your job as an adventure writer is to communicate the details of the adventures, events, and locations in a clear, concise way to the GM running your so the GM running your adventure can effectively translate the adventure to their players at the table. Um, ideally, with as little of prep work as possible. Because let's face it, these days kids got kids got ADD, right? <laughs> I got ADD. So I, sh I stress this a lot in our own writing processes. Uh, sometimes you all may find our adventures and wonder why they're so lean or why a, wi a modern wizard's module is a little light on details. It's because they are trying to get out of the way of the dungeon master who has to run the content. They don't want to give the dungeon master a bunch of details that, while they might be fun, don't impact play and don't allow the players to make an interesting choice. Yeah. So the... They will, we like to give you context for why creatures are behaving the way they're behaving, but we're not going to add a lot of fluff and descriptors to things beyond what's necessary because it's a technical document. The goal of an adventure is for the dungeon master or game master to have the spine of content they need to allow for the players to tell the story at the table through their actions. Yeah. I'd say it's probably the number one when we get manuscripts in from um, people who want to join our writing team. The number one thing that'll probably turn us off, other than you know, like horrible grammar and <laughs> stuff like that, or not following any directions that we gave in the uh, in the in like the process to sign up, would be that if we open up a document and the backstory is like four pages long, we're like, nah, we're not into that. And we'll we'll explain why this whole this whole thing is going to go through and explain to you each of the parts that make up uh, a basic adventure module. Um, and the reality is like the better that you can do this, the better chance you are going to have to sell your products to people. Because um, even though there's a fine line between making things look pretty, I mean, let's face it, like a wizard of the coast um, module is gorgeous, right? You know, there's all this expensive ass art that they've thrown in there from magic, the gathering artists. It's really pretty clean and concise when you really break it down to it. I mean, they've got 40 something years of um, streamlining this process. So that is the one major thing. Like if this is something you're interested in doing professionally, make sure you understand that it is technical writing. Um, all right. How to lay out your adventure. Okay, so the easiest way to start writing your adventure is to lay out its individual components by writing it headers. So the headers are the different parts uh, in the module that are show you um, like basically like the different sections of the book. And this is the way I do it. I think uh, somebody in our last class described it as, uh, what did he say? It was garden writing versus 
some other form of writing. But basically, there's two kinds of people, those who write front to back and then those who lay it out. Personally, I lay my stuff out. It helps me see what I have to do. And then it's essentially ask, asking me back. To, I'm asking myself back to me, what are what are the different things in this? Like there are a series of questions to which I must answer. So for example, when you write the adventure summary header in your adventure, you are essentially asking yourself, what is the summary of this adventure, Dave? Or, you know, whoever, <laughs> to which you should reply in uh, two to three paragraphs. So um, the this is like, if you were someone who has trouble writing for long periods of time or getting out of, you know, like getting beyond 500 words, this can really help because you're, like for me, it tricks me into thinking I'm not writing a 3,000 word adventure. I'm right. I'm answering questions that I wrote for myself. Uh, let's see. And here are what those headers look like when put into fifth edition. Uh, this is using sort of a classic uh, fifth edition style. I think it's actually exactly the uh, elemental evil style, quote unquote, or the one that's used, as a, used in Princes of Apocalypse. Um, Headers help organize your adventure's information architecture and make it easier for the DM running your adventure to understand. First, you have your H1. That's the, the big guy at the top. The H1, or the header one, is going to be used primarily for titles and chapter headers. Um, with 5th edition, usually almost immediately after each one of these appears, the first letter gets a big capitalization, sort of like that and then the rest of the body follows, okay? So especially if you use a program like uh, GM Binder where it does it automatically, you need to be cognizant of that because it can, can technically, it could possibly throw off all of your writing. Um, you can adjust it, of course, by changing the, the code within it, but um, for most part, that's what you need to expect. And if you look through any sort of modern module, I was showing people modules to the screen on Monday, but they couldn't read it, so it was too blurry. So <laughs> you're gonna have to just grab a module for yourself. But like, if you look at something like Tomb of Annihilation, which I've got here, and you look at the first, this chapter here, you can see the first P is capitalized here. And then the chat, the H1 actually is at the top of this in this situation. Okay, next comes up is the H2, uh, which is your major sections of the book. So if you, H1 is going to divide all of your titles and chapters. Hold on one second. I got a hellhound here who wants to come in. Come on. Can you read the sign on the door, Lulu? Um... The H2 divides up your major sections uh, with, within the chapters themselves. So, for example, um, H2 would be stuff like the backstory section, your adventure summary, adventure hooks, um, and any major section within the book itself. So a really good example of this would be like within the um, Monster Manual. Um, there's really only like two main chapters, and then the names of all the monsters are H2s. Next comes H3, which is your subsection. The H3 is usually the one that has an underline on it in typical 5th edition formatting. They further divide subsections within the major sections. And these are commonly used for traits, unordered lists, and uh, usually I use them for rooms. But these will further divide it. So if you look at, like, uh, let's say, like, if you were to open up your player's handbook and you were to look at the Barbarian page you would see that the barbarian's name is an h2 and then all the other stuff is divided into h3s especially when it starts getting down to its traits then when it gets to the subclasses it goes down even further so that's what comes next is the h4 h4 are your unordered lists usually used to divide subsections so these actually cut up the h3 subsections even further usually in into unordered lists. So I think the most common examples of these would be uh, spells and magic items all start with H4s. Um, features within subclasses are start with H4s. Pretty much anything that'll have like a meat, like immediately have like an italicized thing underneath of it. Or, uh, are we doing this tonight, Lulu? Is this what's going on? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, anything that's going to be like a little... Um, it's going to be usually sort of like a list naming off all the individual parts of something. That's usually when the H4 appears. Okay. 
Next up is going to be, interestingly enough, it's not going to be your H5. And I'll get to the reason why in a moment. It's going to actually be bold and italics. Now, this is further dividing H4 lists up. Um, most pro Probably most commonly seen with an adventure themselves, also seen to further divide up H4s if necessary. So a good example of this includes like um, some of the Ranger features where you get to have a, your choice of one through three different things. All of those are done with the uh, bold and italicies, like the three choices that you get with those. Same with uh, the monk, the elemental monk and its features. Those all are done through bold and italicies. All right, I'm gonna hold Lulu because she's driving me crazy right now. <laughs> Next up comes your table header. So this is when the H5 actually makes its appearance. T traditionally, the H5 is only used in two circumstances. One, when it's above any sort of table within any of the books in fifth edition. So it's denoting that there is a table present. The second use for it that you see most often is going to be at the top of a description block or a breakout block. That's pretty much the only time you see the H5 itself. So really the bold and italicies are going to be your stand in for um, like further subdividing H4s. Um, last but not least, this one is probably the rarest of them all, but it does appear hanging in dents. So hanging in dent, you can see is usually going to be italicized or bold, um, one or the other, usually not both, interestingly enough. This further breaks up long blocks uh, to create a bold or italicized hanging indent within <laughs> a, another subsection that's bold or italicized. Uh, the most common usage for this is probably in uh, spell lists within monster box blocks. You also have it within um, the legendary actions within monster blocks. And then when you have things that are really complicated, like complex traps, will sometimes have those hanging in dents. But again, it does not appear very often, like very rarely. If you're down at that point, you should probably reassess how you've formatted everything because it's probably like a little bit too much. But those are more or less the main headers for um, fifth edition formatting and how they all kind of work in their taxonomy. So this is always the, the biggest part. <laughs> we'll take questions sure here questions. if you all have some. Yeah, <clears throat> and I gotta deal with this. Why are you being such a freak to me now? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions regarding the headers uh, before we keep going about how to then write within all of this? Such, uh, somebody commented that it's like mise en place and cooking. Yeah. I want to make yep. sure you have everything that you need right in front of you. Yep. Mise en place. Put in place. Um, the um, yeah, the big thing is is if you've ever written an outline, it's basically what it is. It's an outline, but usually there's body content in between the parts of the outline itself. And that's really what you're doing when you write the headings. You're writing your outline and then you're filling it in with the fluff. And the reason you want to do this is because uh, you want it so that your GM and anybody reading the material that you write can easily search through it um, and find exactly what they're looking for right away. And this is, this is, I would say, really an invention. I mean, it's not new. I mean, headers have been around since, you know, the dawn of time. But the, the usage of headers has really gone up from, like, if you took an old newspaper from the 20s, you know, it's walls of text with very few headers. But now, um, because of blogs and the, the desire to get out information as soon as possible and the way that Google's um, search engines read information, um, there's a lot less body in between headers, uh, especially if you are a search engine optimization expert. And if any of you are going to take the content class, there's going to be more discussion about this because SEO is a really big part of um, doing professional content writing. But uh, like a tool like Yoast will tell you like, whoa, 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 you got too many words. You need to break it up with headers. <laughs> um, you know, if you get beyond like 500 to 1,000 words, it's like, it's too long. Nobody wants to read this. Cut it up. And that's basically how this works, is so that people can find the information that they're looking for as fast as possible. Jordan asked us for, us for a working example. Dave did post a version of the adventure that he's going to kill me in next Wednesday in the Discord. We'll repost well, that, that was the first level adventure after. for five people. I'm going to have to jack it up. 
Um, but you can also, as you all should know, at, the math was wrong. <laughs> you, you can look at uh, almost anything we've released in the last year as an example of this in yeah. action. Uh, Eddie asked us, does a typical adventure have more than one H1? Um, you'd have to get pretty long to do that. To give you, an, to put it into perspective, I just finished, we're just about finishing, uh, uh, what are we, what's about 150 pages on that, Sarge? Vasco um, Valley's like 120 to 150. Jen is not going to be happy. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's a pretty huge book. Um, it's going to take up all of Broadsword number 13. And we have four chapters in it to give you an idea. So Rhyme of the Frostman is 350 pages and has seven chapters. Um, appendices are usually uh, H2 headers, interestingly enough. So though, and well, they're larger H2 headers, but they don't have the first capitalized letter after. So it's pretty rare. It, you would only do it if you had to write a lot of content and there were enough scene changes to warrant it. Um, I think the reason Rhyme does it is because, like, Rhyme, for example, breaks it up as, like, pretty much up until you get to level four, you're still in chapter one. Chapter two is levels four through five. Chapter three and four both take place in Zardarok, right? So that's yeah, the first level, four chapters. Like, chapter three is, like, technically level four through six-ish. Chapter four is technically level seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, six it's, gets you to seven. Yeah, but if you're or writing just like a, eight, I don't remember. a one shot, you'd really just use it for a title. Um, I, w- I mean, with a one shot, I wouldn't even put a TOC in there or a table of contents in there most of the time, just because you know there's there's really not enough information to have to like grok. But when you're doing something like Basco Valley, which you know has God, like what do we have in that? Like twenty something quests or something in it? Yeah, there's about fourteen quests plus the major arc. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that mostly you're gonna use I'd say H twos probably get used the most for dividing major content, followed by H threes. I, I mean I As really... a clarification for yeah. Gooch. When we say H one, H two, H three, we're talking about heading one, heading two, heading three that you would see in a normal word process. Yeah. 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 If you yeah, if you if you were to go to a Google Doc right now and you would look at the top of it. In fact, let me just show you kind of exactly what I mean. Oh. We're going live. I'll answer some questions while we're doing this. Uh, Annie Louvatar asked uh, for examples of both and italics together. You do that like in a room. I give me like room one, the front door, trap, it'll explode. This door, <laughs> this door is emanating an evocation aura. When a creature touches this door, it must succeed. Every creature within 20 feet of the door must succeed on the DC 15 dexterity saving throw or take 10 3d6 fire damage. Yeah. <clears throat> on a failure, half as much on oh, a success. Boy. And then we'd say, like, encounter. Once they open the door, there's a barb devil here. It's going to punch him in the face. <laughs> Treasure. The barb devil had a very nice hat. I and then we'd say, like, it's going to be spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> we'd say, and so we would bold italics the word trap. We'd bold italics encounter. We'd bold italics yeah. treasure, which makes it very easy for a DM who's scanning over your. Oh, don't show them all those things. That's a lot of spoilers there. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll just show them a, a, a brief little tidbit of, um, let's see, what's a good Wyvern King's part? Maybe like part three. So this is the book we're releasing this week. So if you're a patron, you'll, you'll get to see it. This is what, don't let all this scare you. It's way easier than it looks like. And we're going to go over that next week. But you can see here's an H2. I've done these by H3s. Um, I think... Does this one end and go into chapter? I think this one ends. Okay. Let me get another one. There's a gun. There's a gun. <laughs> There's a lot of guns. It's a Let's weapon. see. Are these fonts readily available or cheap? I think we're just using fonts that are inside of GM Binder. But we may yeah. No, I use, I use my... I, these are Google fonts, actually. Um, and uh, you can reference them pretty much anywhere. Oh, wait. That's Lou. Dang it. Go, I, I have. Let me get my one. I'm looking for pass. Nick asked, "Do we actually write our material in a D&D style, or just in a word and then pretty it up after?" Uh, the answer to that is we write in Google Docs and the appropriate markdown. We'll explain this in a couple of slides, yeah. and then it goes into GM Binder, which then reads that to present in the appropriate style. 
So here you'll see this is an um, adventure that me and the writers wrote. Uh, you can see here's the H1 with the immediate capitalization of the first letter. This is H2 here. Um, H3 comes in, hanging in dents, one of the rare times you use it. <laughs> It uh, comes up a lot in Wizards content for location information. It stands yeah. out that way. Here's an H4, so you can see the locations. Here you can see there's your first bald metallices. There's your H5 there at the top of a, a header. But you can see um, all of these have H4s, then it goes to another H3, and so on. Um, and then here's a breakout text with an H5 at the top. And that's pretty much, here's another great one. Like, look at all these. Like, these are all hanging in dents too, introducing different uh, quests. Um, so I didn't end up using it. Like, here's another uh, Bald Natalysis uh, one that I've done here. So as you can see, this is what a finished document is going to end up looking like. And like I said, don't be scared of all this stuff or all this gibberish over here. It's really easy to learn. Um, and this tool, GM Binder, which I'm going to introduce you guys to next week, is going to um, show you how to do it all in a nice, easy way. Of course, if you have a skill set like that's got like um, uh, uh, like InDesign or something in it, you know, you can lean on those. But for those who are just starting out, you want to use a cool tool like this because um, it makes it. I would recommend that's, even that's for perfect. people who have skills with InDesign, please do not draft your content in InDesign. InDesign is an amazing tool. But it is a publishing tool, not a not a drafting tool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I say that as like we make and we make broadsword in InDesign. InDesign is amazing, but Scott tells us all the time that he does not have a, a spell checker or a grammar checker in InDesign, so he can't yes. fix errors that he yeah, doesn't we, see on his own. I, I used to draft primarily in um Lulu is driving me crazy, man. She's being super extra. Um <laughs> like just so annoying. When she wants to do the in and out deal, um, the I used to write in, believe it or not, on my blog, which um, blog writing like Google Documents, for example, has all those headers in there, and so would my blog, which was on WordPress. And then I would um, I would use that, so I would have the SEO, so it would like tell me like if I was using too much passive voice and stuff like that. And also Grammarly works with it. I uh, highly recommend if you're going to be a writer, by the way, to get Grammarly. Um, it's great and it's free. Um, that well, at least most of the the cool doodads you need it free. You can get like an upgraded version for like fifty bucks a year. But, um, but yeah, like uh, I used to do that. And then when I started building out the team, and now we've got proofers and stuff like that, I write primarily in Google Documents. And if any of you were to be hired to the company, we'd ask the same, and you would end up putting in all your headers using hashtags um, to denote which ones are going to be. So once you cut and paste and do the GM binder, it automatically formats all of it for you. But that's a little bit more advanced. I wouldn't worry about learning that now. But like I said, this is something like if, if you were to come on our team, that's generally the format we accept our uh, drafts in. So anyways. Uh, Annie Louvatar is asking, uh, what's the difference between home brewery and GM binder? Uh, I mean, GM Binder is better. Sorry. <laughs> I used, <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody here used home brewery. I've used home brewery. I used it um, starting out. Uh, it's got a few things that I think it does well. And keep in mind, I haven't used it in two years, but uh, Levi Roselle, who runs GM Binder, is pretty active on it. And he had a pretty successful Kickstarter to keep funding it last year. Uh, and he's he, really active and great in the community. If you prefer homebrewery, by all means, use it. But um, I used to be homebrewery, and someone was like, try Dream Binder. I'm like, okay, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> this is better. And I uh, I switched to Dream Binder. Hayden's asking uh, when we use bold italics for hanging in. We explained it here a little bit, but you mostly want to use bold italics. And we primarily are going to use it when we're listing things related to something under an H3 or an H4. Like when we do, we often do like adventure hooks and under heading three. And then like the three hooks we like to include will be bold italics. Yeah. Um, when yeah. you're listing out things that are in a room in your location, you usually will have common stuff as bold italics. You'll put the encounter in the name as bold italics, trap, and its name is bold italics, treasure as bold italics, yeah. and secret door as bold italics. Yeah, yeah. When when we get to the section on key encounters, we'll show you kind of the um the uh, taxonomy for organizing that information and why you want to call certain things out. Um, 
especially triggered, any kind of triggered events and secret items should kind of stand out. And that's really what bold metallics is really good for is breaking up long blocks of text. That's why I say it, it kind of acts like its own H tag. It's not technically an H tag because, well, blah, 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 SEO, uh, Google search engines can't really crawl it, but um, it, it's, it, it helps the eye when you're going through it. Uh, we have a couple of folks, including Michael and Alex, asking about uh, the cost of GM Binder. It's free. Uh, it's free for the basic. For the version that has autosave, <laughs> uh, there is a cost. I, I recommend you get that one. <laughs> Few Nothing things are is... more fun than Dave sending me angry messages that I read from two in the morning. Yeah. He's like, I just lost. 30? Yeah, I just lost keep, two hours of work, Sarge! <laughs> yeah, keep in mind that um, Gene Binder is still relatively new in the grand scheme of things. I think it's been around maybe three years tops um, compared to like an Adobe product like InDesign or a Microsoft product or, you know, a Google product, which, you know, have very few bugs. So there is a potential to crash on you. So you definitely want to have something that's going to save a lot. Still, I have, recommend having your content in Google Docs and then move it over. Yeah, having said that, it's it's way more user friendly than um, most stuff that's out there, and um, it like InDesign. I mean, if you got InDesign, for example, I mean that it costs fifty bucks a month for the Adobe suite. If you are an Adobe ninja, go with Adobe. You know, if that's what you know. Uh, still, I mean, like if you were to work for us, we prefer everything in Google Docs because it makes it accessible and we can access it and then we put it wherever it needs to go if it's in a version that needs to go onto a pdf like this then i usually will do it in gm binder myself at least for now uh laura is slowly showing me that she wants to take that over so she might end up doing it and then uh, if it's going to go into broadsword monthly uh scott does it through indesign so yeah for all the different ways that we deploy adventures we prefer people to write in markdown that is gm binder friendly because yeah it works for a lot of things you do. Uh, Michael asked us, oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Michael. It was Brandon. Brandon asked us, is there a disadvantage to selling adventures if you use your own formatting style or should you stick to the Wizards of the Coast style? Absolutely, there is a disadvantage. And it's not that I don't think it's a great idea or that I think Wizards of the Coast does it perfectly. It's that this is what they've trained everybody to read with their, their content for, um, I would say probably going as far back as third edition, because third edition, was born in the age of the internet when uh, blogs were really starting to come to be. Uh, when De when a young man named F. Williams created blogger.com. <laughs> and uh, the this format they use is basically that. And the thing, the reason why I say there'd be a disadvantage, um, meaning you roll two dice and take the lowest result, is that <laughs> the the people who are going to read your content, they know how to read this already. Whether or not they know it, they've been trained to read this way. So they know what to expect. So doing it differently is only going to create a hurdle for your people. Now, by all means, create whatever you like. Um, it's your content, you know, however you want to sell it. If it works, great. You know, please reinvent the wheel. I mean, nothing's nothing's perfect. Remember, this is a, this is really only a style that's been in. Uh, for like the last 20 years in the age of HTML and CSS. Yeah, and I think the big but... thing, we stress this a lot, and we I stress this to the writers. We are not trying to defeat Wizards of the Coast as third-party creators. We are explicitly benefiting from the design work and the audience that they've trained. So battling that is in many ways a waste of your own energy no no stylistically <laughs> so you know like the fonts and stuff yeah you can do whatever for that but the the organization of it i recommend it being the same I mean, but i'm holding a uh, chaosium product here it's the same thing it's just different fonts but it's the same sort of arrangement and how they do everything in there you know so it's it's really really what we're showing you is even though it's got the fancy D, &D style fonts like uh God, I can't think of the name of their fonts now, like uh, <laughs> no Modesto caps and, you know, whatever. Um, like stylistically it can look like whatever you want. That's fine. In fact, it's recommended um, if you go to publish like physical products outside of doing like a PDF or something because you don't want to be using their trade dress. But 
the in terms of like the organization of the information absolutely i mean it's not it's not something they even invented right this is something that's pretty universal there's a little intricacies here and there like they bold the monster names to reference the monster manual like that's something you really only see in fifth edition products but overall like i said i mean this is what you know uh 20 something books that have come out in fifth edition have trained people to understand and, and read in terms of uh, the way their information is organized all right let's make sure we yep. move through the slides yeah this is this one is always surprisingly a little bit longer all right so we're going to break down what the different pieces of um an adventure looks like and um there's going to be some things here and there that might change, but overall, this is what kind of what I call like the Dungeon Magazine slash Broadsword monthly format. Um, this is the way Dungeon Magazine pretty much started doing it from <clears throat> the time Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro purchased the property back in the early 2000s. Uh, I think it's a great way of doing it, and it's a way that we've adopted in our content. It gives you pretty much all the basics you need for an adventure without being too fluffy. Granted, the, the, you know, the bigger modules are going to divide things up a little bit more. But if you look at something like Yawning Portal or uh, another anthology book like Ghosts of Saltmarsh, they pretty much follow this path, too. So the first major thing that's going to come in your adventure, especially a one shot, uh, is going to be the preamble. The preamble introduces your adventure. It pretty much gives you like one, maybe two paragraphs that includes... Um, all the basic things that DMs know, which are basically first the intended addition for the adventure, the number of characters and average level for which the adventure was designed, plus any flexibility that the adventure might have. Also, it should, I, I don't think I have this on the slide, but any sort of special considerations. So um, pretty much my preamble is exactly the same every single time, word for word. It says this blah, blah, blah adventure was designed for three to five characters of seventh to ninth level and is optimized for four characters of eighth level or eight characters with an average party level of eight. Um, that's that first line there that I use. Then any special party makeup that the adventure relies on, like this adventure has a lot of undead in it, so a cleric is highly recommended, um, would be come next. Next, an elevator pitch for the adventure. The adventure takes place in an ancient tomb filled with undead led by an evil necromancer. Or the characters must go into an ancient tomb to kill a necromancer who's been reviving the undead. And then finally, any special campaign notes. Those notes would be like, this takes place in Steel Church in Omeria, but can just as easily fit into any setting where an ancient tomb would not be out of place. Uh, you can't name specific campaign settings by Wizards of the Coast, obviously because it's their intellectual property, unless you are writing for DMs Guild. But you know, you can say like, if you were writing like a jungle adventure, you could say, you know, any sort of jungle setting with lots of undead, wink, wink, in their jungle where there's a lich with a dungeon. You know, you can kind of hint at some of that stuff, but still. Don't go saying like, oh yeah, this work in Forgotten Realms and blah, blah, blah. Like, don't do that. But this preambles generally doesn't need to be any more than one paragraph in each of these different things, one sentence. You want to have it so that the DM can read it and get a sense of what the adventure is about. This also works great as your marketing copy if you were to sell your product uh, on any sort of platform or uh, Roll20 or something like that. All right. Next, the backstory. So the backstory usually comes next. It offers up the details of everything that happened before the characters became involved in the adventure. It works as a way for the DM to understand the adventure's NPCs, any ongoing plots, and anything that the DM should know before they run the adventure. Make sure that the backstory is informative, but not too long, especially if the adventure is relatively simple. I would say you're typically like if it's just an adventure that sees people going there to beat up like some bandits or something you really only have to explain what the bandits did to go there and why they are in a certain place but you don't need to know the lead bandit's favorite color and <laughs> what when his birthday is and stuff like that um in a lot of older adventures you'll see really long backstories um and i think that's mostly 
because they were just trying to fluff up word count and backstory is a great place to fluff up word count because you can turn it into fiction. But I would tell you that as a modern adventure writer, try to stay away from that. You want to have um, your backstory be concise and to the point. The only time I think a backstory can maybe be a bit longer is if it's a particularly complicated event-based adventure. with a lot of moving parts, like a mystery. You want to be very detailed because you don't want you want to make sure nothing's messed up in there. And then as a like an intrigue or story, anything like that. But your basic location based adventures are usually going to be, I mean, half a column, a full column at most. That's about it. Next. The adventure. Comment, I'll comment real quick on the backstory stuff. Um, oh, sorry. You're Rhyme just of... a black block. And oh, I didn't that shit. I don't know. <laughs> okay. That's it. And um, and even Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, it's broken up as basically three sentences and then three subheadings about the three plot lines involved. Yeah. Even Wizard of the Coast has started condensing the introductory stuff so that the the, the game master, dungeon master, is going to run it is not overwhelmed with details, which was the primary complaint we had for Storm King's Thunder. We were like, there's 10 Prince pages on the ordning. Prince's reading. Apocalypse, too, is really bad about it. It's like, oh my god, there's so much. Um, I would recommend your backstory, your background for most of your adventures not exceed 500 words. Um, unless you're writing more than 80 pages of adventure, you really don't need to go more than 500 words. Like, yeah. You only need to explain the who, what, where, when, and why of your adventure. Who's here? What are they doing? How are they going about doing it? Why they're doing it? And what's the timeline that matters here that's the yeah. primary information a game master needs to manage the drama at the table for the sake of the players so please what we're try seeing, to focus on keeping that tight what we're seeing a lot too is that instead of taking all those backstory elements that used to appear at the beginning of adventures like even the long ones because there's a lot of details in rhyme right that need to be done but they're not done all within the first chapter anymore they're being divided up and put into different sections like um perfect example and i hope this isn't any spoilers for anybody about rhyme of the frost maiden in zardarok's fortress there's a um like an inner feud between zardarok and another durgar woman none of that's mentioned within um the first chapter but once you actually get there they're like oh this is some things that's going on that you need to know about too and it's kind of piling on the story for the dm too so they're also getting surprised and they don't have to re you know slog through eight pages of backstory just to be able to run adventure and they're going to end up forgetting most of the stuff by the time they get to that point anyways and have to go back and read it uh, furthermore like with some of the important npcs that are in the game um their information is even kept in the appendix like here's the history of this person it's not really necessary for you to know it, but we're going to put it in the back here in case you want to know it. Another place yeah, that you'll Eric, see... Eric just asked us about that. Can you put more detailed backstory into the appendix? Absolutely. That's a good place to put it. It's very useful. But even then with the appendix, you're more trying to make... You're more contributing to like the chapter four of the DMG roles for the sake of the Dungeon Master. Like yeah. in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, I'm not going to spoil it, but all of the sort of psychology of oral and why she's doing what she's doing is explained in detail in the appendix around her various stat blocks. Yeah. Even though they give you some sense of it in the first half, in the first part of the book. And that's really useful because it keeps the, the game master from having to process too many details at one time. Yeah. The, the big thing is too, is um, it's asking, and I know it's crazy. And I know we live in a time where reading is hard for a lot of people, <laughs> but asking someone to read, five pages of backstory to run an adventure that might not even work past two sessions. It's a pretty big investment. And I think Wizards of the Coast recognized this with their products. And they realized that by the time like it really matters who Oral is or matters who Zardarok is, you're more invested and you want to read that stuff. Like, oh, what's her deal? Mm, that's messed up. That's you know? honestly the best way to think about it is just like the, the adventure has to prove itself to the players to be interesting. It's the same for the game master too. Yep. Yeah, you were writing. You were writing. You're writing for the game master who needs who needs to write for the players essentially, and they not not really write, but you know what I mean. Like because um, my buddy Charlie, who runs um, a lot of games and is in my current game, like he says, he doesn't really like to run modules most of the time because he likes things being surprising too. But he thinks that the design of Rhyme of the Frostbitten is better because it pretty much tells you like, hey, you only need to read 
like this and this and what you're going to run that day. You don't have to read anything else. And it's one of the first products by Wizards of the Coast ever to just say that. So anyways, back to the, the point of backstories. Keep it, give it enough information that the DM can understand where things are coming from. And don't you don't really have to go beyond that because they can insert it into their and they're going to change it anyways. <laughs> so by doing that's all that honestly it, better. Like let let the tables build the game the way they want it to be. Yeah. It's going to be more fun for everybody that way anyway. Yep. All right. Let's not get too lost in that. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's probably the second that. area. I think that's the second point of contention we have a lot, with a lot of new writers. Like they really want to write flowery backstories, and we're just like it's not necessary. And we're not buying it. <laughs> like this what it comes down to. Like, quit trying to beef up your word count. We don't, we don't need it. Um, uh, adventure summary. Adventure summary offers a quick overview of the adventure and everything that the character should do from the moment they receive the adventure hook until they reach the adventure's conclusion. Sections should be very easy to read. In fact, make it a bullet point list if you necessary. Really just like, here's what they find out. Here's what they need to go. This is what they got to do when they get there. See ya. That's that's pretty much it. Um, in bigger books, they now do uh, flow charts that shows you how the adventures should uh, flow, and that's more or less what you do. You don't have to do that with a short adventure. You don't may, may need to make your own flow chart, but um, you should have an adventure summary that's pretty concise, so the DM can like be like, "Oh, okay, great. I know exactly how to run this now." Next up is the adventure hook. Um, this is when you start getting a little bit more into what the DM needs to offer to run the game. And the adventure hook explains exactly how the characters become involved in the adventure and should include where are the characters when the adventure starts, who are the major NPCs, even if they're not there in person, what reason do the characters have to cross a threshold, which basically means the decide that they want to do the adventure. Uh, and then what are the explicit rewards for completing the adventure, i.e., uh, treasure in the form of rewards, you know, fame, forbidden lore, etc. Um, this is also, I don't think I ever put it in there. Yeah. This is also one of those areas where I think read aloud text blocks really come in. And the importance of a read around read aloud text block, which is usually a block of text that tells the GM what to read. The purpose of those is always going to be so that you are it, Get telling the DM exactly what to repeat to the characters so they do not miss specific details that need to be given to the characters. It's like if you give them just a little bit of like, and you know, this guy says this, this, and this, he might, the, the GM might miss something. But if you give it like a reroute text block, not only are you making their job easier, because let's face it, reading just straight out of the book is pretty easy to do. Um, you're also making sure that there's no confusion in what you intend to have happen with your adventure. Okay. And a lot of times it's, I mean, I've looked at products that go back 30 plus years and you'll see they have the answer to every single one of these questions within that read aloud, read aloud text block in the adventure hook. Um, let's answer questions on those because the adventure bridge can be a little bit more, um, that's a yeah, bit if people section. have questions about uh, background and giving adventure hooks, uh, please place them in the chat. Yeah, an adventure summary and a preamble, too. Let's see. Michael asks, is the backstory more for the DM or the players? Like, is this what they will use to let the players understand? It's, the, it's for the DM. Um, it's for the DM so they can understand the who, what, when, where, how, why of the story and things that happen on, in the background. And sometimes even in an adventure, you see this in Wizards products, they'll say a character who succeeds on a check will get the information within the found in the background of this section. Or an NPC, an NPC ally they found can explain to the characters the information found in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's a way to not fully like waste it, as it were. Yeah, but perfect, it's, it's perfect example of that is. I was okay. gonna say Fandelver is a perfect example of that. Like the block that gives you all the the history of uh, Fandolin and the Fandelver mine is, um, like it, it'll tell you like this guy, this character could tell you all the history that's of Fandelver that's in this block of text. Looks like we're good on questions for now. I'll catch up anybody I else. Stun them questions. all. Stun. Oh. 
Oh, hey, here's a good one. You like this one. Corby asks, what about starting in media res? Like, just jumping past the meeting in a tavern and starting on the road to the first encounter? Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Uh, that's, dude, that's like the... Um... Fandolin starts that. Like, Lost Man of Fandelver starts yeah. that way. Yeah, there's You're on the road, no, like, you got yes hired no. by a dude, there's goblins. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, you can totally start many res. Like, uh, in fact, I think like it's a little bit easier because um, you don't have to think so much. Like, if the it's a little hard deterministic, right? Um, but it is a great way to start an adventure because there's no like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, it's like, no, it's, you're doing this. Because <laughs> then, like, if you don't have if you don't have a yes or no adventure hook, it's just like this is what you're doing. Um, the characters don't have the option to you know wander off and do something else. It's like you're on a wagon. With a bunch of supplies, gonna go meet a, a dwarf somewhere, or uh, um, and uh, 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 oh, there's goblins, you know. <laughs> oh man, we got a lot of good questions. It looks like there's a chat delay that I need to account for. Oh. Got a couple of really good questions here. So, uh, two of them are kind of similar. Eddie asked, should hooks have different appeals, like appeal to greed, appeal to fame? And we had a similar question from Brandon: Are different options for adventure hooks okay? Yep. yep. The answer to both of you is yes. We usually like to give three. We usually like to appeal to the heroic players, which is me. Tell me I get to be a hero. I will go on the adventure. Uh, you got also, players who want to get... <laughs> if you want to... Yeah. You feel players like to get paid. A lot of the players I run for like to get paid. They do not go on quests. So they are not going to get money mm -hmm. or magic items. Joe. Or you appeal to mystery. Some people really like figuring out weird stuff in the world. And they will go on the weirdest quest possible because it sounds weird. That almost yeah. happened to us in our Frostmaiden game. Like there was a crashed meteor and I'm like, oh, I want to go see that time to make a space sword yep x yeah it's 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 really i think it's those three that really comes down to it like if you can cover all three of those as your explicit rewards for completing the adventure um getting paid fame you know or doing the right thing forbidden lore like usually those will do it um deus ex sometimes has a negative effect like a a, a, a very popular trope has been to um, throughout the history of DD is like you're in prison you gotta break out sometimes that can rub some folks the wrong way like oh i don't want to start like this but um for the most part i think your adventure hook if you are going to have an adventure hook in there and not just start someone media res that yeah you should try to appeal to all the different types of characters and players mm -hmm. i don't want to get into an extensive conversation about starting in a prison i generally would oppose most of our writers using that as a hook for any of their adventures as a starting point because starting the players in jail starts the players in a position where they have extremely limited agency. Yeah. Which can create a lot of hostile encounters at the table. And as a third party writer, you just don't want to inflict that on the people who are running your content unless you've got a lot of really good tools there. And I think even when Wizards tried it in this edition, I don't think they did necessarily the best job. On yeah, it's a pretty it's a that. pretty old school trope that I don't think has aged very well. And I recognize that it's on the um, the adventure introduction table in the DMG that we rolled on a couple weeks ago. But um, I think there's there's creative ways to do it. You just have to be careful with it because, like like Sarge says, um, fifth edition is very much about a game about giving players a lot of power, a first level. Um, character has way more power than a first or second level character did than maybe even a fifth level character did back in first and second edition. So to take all that way from the beginning, especially as a surprise, like a gotcha surprise, if they if you had a session zero and you explain kind of that's what it was going to happen, that's one thing. But the players um, agree to it. You can do anything as long as the players agree. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. And definitely situation. make sure it's clear in your adventure hook. And I would even say in your preamble to like, hey, this starts this way. You should probably share that information with your players beforehand just to make sure that they're they're down with it. Uh, Sharp Barad asked, I have a significant amount of read aloud in the hook to get players on their way. Is it a danger of railroading if it's used too often? Um, the read aloud, like I said, its main purpose is to make sure that the dungeon master isn't missing anything that you need to communicate. It's basically like you are phoning as a writer, the characters, the players yourself. Uh, There's, speaking um, through the DM. I think his name is Sean Merwin. I apologize if I got his name wrong. Yeah. He did a couple of articles on D and D beyond about writing adventures. He had a very great article about using read aloud text and 
some of his advice I still think is very I still think is valuable, and I would probably link other authors too. Uh, he stresses that you want to describe passive details in a way that allows the players to determine what it looks like for them. I don't like, and I usually steer writers from using second person when they're writing read aloud text. I don't like them writing you because it can presume a lot of details about the prospective character who's receiving mm -hmm. information. Like if the character is hard of hearing or has limited vision, you don't want to necessarily to say your character hears this and you have somebody who can't hear at your table as you're trying to give these details. It's better to describe things like birds, like the loud chirping of birds uh, fills this room, uh, fills this room. On the western side, an ugly rug rises up and approaches the door. That allows the players to determine how their characters are perceiving it based on their senses. Mm -hmm. And another thing I'd recommend not doing with box text is don't narrate player behavior. If you need the players to acknowledge something in your box text, put a stop, say, let the characters respond to the hag offering them a apple, and then say, then continue your box text from mm -hmm. there. Don't decide the players did something in box text. That is a huge no-no in terms of player agency. Yeah. Um, you'll see it in older content, but definitely in newer stuff. Like I think the idea of like using passive um, text or passive d details, and you, we'll see a lot of this when we talk about key locations, as well as making sure any obvious clues stand out, as well as um, certain lines of dialogue that you need to have said. Otherwise, um, I would I would go against it. I mean, yeah, it's nice, but it can be kind of like exhausting too to read a lot of box text. So just just to uh, kind of play it by ear and test it out. Let's. Um... Uh, yeah, Michael, we're gonna move along. I'll see if I can find the article while I'm while Dave's going over the adventure bridge. Yeah. So the adventure bridge is not necessarily a section. Pretty much the adventure bridge is what takes the characters from the hook to the location and or next scene. It's um, everything kind of in between. So it can be as simple as a hand wave, like kind of like you said with the media res. Uh, you can say the sage gives you directions to the abandoned keep, takes you want to get, get there when you arrive, dot, dot, dot. Or it could be a little bit more complicated, like the characters have to uncover clues, follow certain paths to get to where they want to go. Um, you find tracks that lead from the stolen gems into the forest, make a DC 14 wisdom survival check to see where they go. Um, the bridge can be very long or could be very short. And if you, again, referencing um, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, a lot of the initial adventures in it um, have like a lot of the, the first starter quests that you get have a lot of that hand wave, like, and you're there. Right, maybe one or two things along the way, but it's pretty pretty quick. Whereas the other quests that take you further outside into Icewind Dale, there's going to be a lot more steps along the way. You're going to have more random encounters. You're going to have more bad weather going on the way. You might have to follow certain trails or try to uh, uncover certain clues to find certain locations. So those types of things will happen in the bridge. Um, like I said, this is not really like a section. You don't call it like, this is the adventure bridge. <laughs> you can if you want. Maybe there's literally a bridge for adventure. But <laughs> the uh, uh, overall, this is just pretty much what takes you from the hook to the next thing. All right. Next comes the location introduction. The location introduction offers the characters their first impression of the location. Location can be as simple as a vine-covered hole in the side of a hill. Or it could be as grandiose as a giant foreboding castle on a hill casting a long, ominous shadow over the local village. Best place to offer the location introduction is in between the section header for the location itself and the location's general features. You might also create another subsection, uh, H3 or header 3, called Arrival, which details the actual steps it takes to reach the introduction. Finally, offering a read aloud text block for the DM helps describe any details about the location that you feel are appropriate. Again, many of the passive details of the location, things that you can get just by kind of glancing, smelling, hearing, you know, using your uh, five senses, um, any sort of clues that you want to stand out, maybe notes about um, what types of uh, guards might be out front of it or anything like that. Again, remember the read aloud text block should be mostly passive details and major clues that you don't want to miss. 
Okay, going deeper into describing your location, next you have the general features. And the general features is very important and it will save you a ton of time as a writer and help you really write better when you understand that its actual purpose is it's a subsection that offers the catch-all features or details for location, saving you the trouble of having to repeat those features over and over and over again. Okay, and you'll see that a lot in old writing. They would explain, they tell you the the height of the ceiling in every freaking room. Like, oh my gosh, you know. So what the general features will do is it'll usually say something. It'll start by saying, unless stated otherwise, this location has the following features, and then it breaks it down into um, further subsections. Uh, typically, it goes the architecture of the place, which is the ceilings, floors, and walls, talking about the building materials used to create those, or if they're natural, you know, carved into stone like a cave or a cavern or something. Also, is sure to note the typical size for ceilings throughout the complex. Um, I find that you can really, like, it makes your life way more easier to say your ceilings, like, you have one, two sizes for ceilings, one in corridors, one for rooms. If it's ever bigger, you would note it in the actual key locations. Um, same thing with the walls. Like it's, it's, um, you know, this castle is made from um, a, a, a dressed brick and mortar um, all the way throughout. The floors are made from polished marble and the ceilings are uh, arched and 15 feet off the floor. And then if you went into a ballroom that had like 30 foot high ceilings, that's when you would change it up. But otherwise, unless stated otherwise, it has these features. Uh, doors, another thing that you just don't, like, it'll get tiresome explaining over and over again. Explain the ma building materials used for the doors, if any. You know, maybe you have exterior and interior doors, but you really don't need more than uh, one or two descriptions for doors. Um, if any, also, you need to determine what happens if the door is locked or stuck and what checks the characters might need to make to get those open. Having a different DC for each door is just tedious and redundant. It's um, better if you just say it's like one for all, unless it's you know particularly difficult, then you would say it in the individual key locations. But I can't tell you the number of times that I have typed this in general features. Uh, Sarge will probably laugh, but it's like, this door is made out of oak. If it has uh, hung on iron hinges with iron bands, if locked, it requires a character with proficiency in thieves tools to make a DC 15 dexterity check or a successful strength athletic or dc 20 strength athletics checks the door has 18 hit point or excuse me 15 ac 18 hit points and immunity to poison and psychic <laughs> and you don't want to have to write that 100 times for every single door that comes in you put it in general features you're done right so there's really no need to have a different one for each one unless one door is particularly more difficult than the other or a little bit easier uh, you can also put in secret doors in this area, too. So if you have a place that has a lot of secret doors, you could say there are secret doors throughout the complex. Finding a secret door requires a successful DC whatever wisdom perception check. And uh, like Dungeon of the Mad Mage, for example, has tons of secret doors. And it pretty much right in the beginning of the book tells you there are 20 across the board, unless stated otherwise. And they're pretty much all 20. Um, Illumination, what sort of lighting is found throughout the location, if any. If it's a dark underground cavern, it might not have any uh, illumination, so say that. So, And then also mention something like the read aloud text assumes that the players have dark vision or um, their own light sources. If it's like a building in the middle of the day, you could say there's plenty of windows that bring in natural light and illumination. At nighttime, it might have a fire in the, you know, there's, there's candles in every room. This is, again, it's just a catch-all, so you don't have to describe it in every single one of your keyed locations. Um, next, unusual features. Make sure to note any unusual features found throughout the location. Um, is there a persistent smell? Is there a weird noise? Um, is there something kind of unique about it? These are really more fun just to help it set it apart from... Um, the typical, you know, the boring old... Yeah, we've all been to the old crumbling keep, and we've all been to the tomb, but, like... Like take um, Fandelver, for example, Wave Echo Cave has that constant crushing sound of the waves that's coming there. It has no real effect in the game other than it's kind of like, wow, that's kind of weird and different. And, it, you know, it's what comes at its name is the Wave Echo Cave. But that feature is described within the general features. And, you you know, it reminds you, you know, it doesn't put it in every room. You just can remind people as they go through the game. Finally, random encounters. If it's big enough, when I mean big enough, I mean like should have like 30 plus rooms. Um, to warrant random encounters, 
you want to make sure to include those in general features as well, potentially in its own subsection. So those <laughs> are the general features block of location. <laughs> well, the, Dave like takes said, a chance to recover. We'll take questions <laughs> from you folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's really important to write all this because God knows, like if you go back through old modules, especially I mean, like everyone everyone is telling you the size of the ceiling and what the doors are. It's like, oh my God, just tell me once. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we liked how in Mad Mage it said, unless they did otherwise, a room is as tall as it is wide. Yep, that's so useful. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think you'll find generally, they'll say like uh, chambers are 15 feet high and corridors are 10 feet high. You know, that's pretty common. Like the corridors are shorter than the uh, the chambers themselves. But I, I like that in Mad Mage too, where it's like there is a tall as they are wide. And like, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Joseph Moore asked us, would you include random encounters for a one shot? I would say it really depends on what you're running, but I got to be honest. I'm not a huge fan of random encounters personally, even as a game master. Yeah. So, because they don't, unless like it's like one of the things that I really like in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, we're going to talk about, we're going to praise Rhyme a lot. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, in chapter two of Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, it has a couple, it has about 17 or 18 wilderness encounters the party can run into. I think this is more useful than the enormous tables in Tomb of Annihilation because these encounters come with specific flavor designed by the writers to add specific experiences to the world, which includes running into, I'm going to spoil this part of Rhyme, a white, an, a, an ancient white dragon with a skeleton riding in a, <laughs> on a She's blind too. Don't forget she's blind. On, on her back. And she's <laughs> on her back and she's blind. <laughs> Someone come, so like, come within 60 feet of me so I can feel you. The other thing with the tables, location. I think tables are a lot take a lot longer to write than regular stuff. And you can find yourself spending a lot of time on a table that someone's either going to not use or barely use. And it's, again, a question for you, like, where what's the most effective use of your time writing those sort of things? Yeah, Random encounters can be useful. I would say, again, in Rhyme, in Chapter 8, I'm not going to spoil the, I'm sorry, in Chapter... Four, five. No, it is eight. In chapter eight, there is a wandering encounter that will appear regularly in the dungeon. And I think that's more flavorful than just, oh, some goons might show up. Oh, roll on this table three times a day. If you get this, then you do this. The more steps I have to follow, the less I'm likely to deploy a mechanic. Yeah, the you really have to understand the purpose of um, random encounters is there's a few different reasons. One, it's to um, come up with the to, to deliver a sense of what the world is all about and what it like. It's it's like little end it like features. Okay, is you want, it's it's good for like setting the tone and the flavor of the adventure. Um, two, it is good for spicing things up when the characters are at a roadblock or you know they just can't decide what to do. You do that to kind of like jolt them. And then the third reason I would use it is uh, if you're running out of material that you've prepped, nothing like a random encounter to slow the game down. Because <laughs> a random encounter will eat up and easily eat up like 30 minutes to an hour of time. So I, I will use them in that situation too. Um, but yeah, in terms of, it really just depends on the adventure. Like, you know, we mentioned the adventure bridge as connecting um, the pieces. If you've got a longer story to tell or you wanted to make it like clear, like, if it makes sense in the grand scheme of things, do it. Or you're in like a really weird location that, you know, the DM couldn't just pull something out of Xanathar's. Like you're in like uh, like a volcanic landscape. You know, there's there's no table for that in Xanathar. So, you know, like and there's like fire elements and stuff. Yeah, you might do that in there just to drive home the point that this isn't like an alien terrain. But for the most part, um, the too long didn't read here is like I would keep most of them in longer content um or bigger areas again it's like it's subjective to the content i guess you could say george asked us uh, so when would you note this information in the adventure itself when it comes to the place itself before all the places so you would have your background as a heading two then heading three would be like adventure hooks another one will be a another heading three will be adventure summary and then you might have a heading to that your bridge like traveling to the event to the location when mm -hmm. the players come with them one mile of this place run 
one of the following encounters. Yeah. Oh, a ghost. Oh, a lizard. Ah. Oh, a bandit. And then you would have a heading two that's like the big location. Yeah. And then you'd have the the location flavor. And then you'd have a heading three that's general features. Yeah. So this is a um oh, hey, right here. Caves of Silence. Yeah, this is Caves of Silence from <laughs> one of our writers, um, TJ. Um and this starts with an H2 and then goes in H3. Normally, if you were writing, like if this was an adventure, which you, now keep in mind, this adventure is part of a bigger book. So the H tags are a little bit different, but this would be your yeah, H1. All of his H tags are basically stepped down by one. Yeah, because yeah, because the... because they're in a, a chapter. But then, yeah, you see it's got the background section. It's got your quest hooks. Uh, they're called quest hooks and not adventure hooks because quests in this taxonomy are a smaller part of the adventure, which is the whole book. So any confusion there. Um uh probably didn't probably could have used an adventure summary but this i mean this is like three pages it's like go to the place and punch some spiders um then you have the location itself <laughs> come here spider- that's the adventure <laughs> it's just it spider- is the adventure <laughs> we love tj but this is the adventure it's also just spiders <laughs> yeah just go to the place and punch some spiders so the people can have their jobs back uh, how american is that um <laughs> the uh Oh, there's spiders <laughs> took our germs um yeah you go to the <sighs> cave you got your general features here ceilings floors and walls see webs tunnels there's your unique feature and illumination i don't think there's enough doors to warrant him writing about the doors so that's probably why i left it out and then he gets starts getting into the keyed locations which is the next um section of this but if you look through all these adventures um like Here's one that I wrote, for example, as part of the thing, same thing. Um, Welcome to the Broken Crossbows pretty much gives you a text block to read. This is really setting tone more than anything. Start. This is a starter quest. Let me see if I can find oh, another. You have Vows of Sunrise yeah. art. Yeah. No, no. That's it's about the house at sunrise. Prayer in the morning. Ooh. <laughs> Background quest hooks. Uh, this is a bridge driving the herd general features for the location so this one is like you're, you're traveling with the cat hurt so you can see it's like there's a little bit of variation on it but most of those things are still there so even though you're like going along like a trail in this situation there's like this which breaks it up um and gives you general features for that and then it has trail encounters which are your key locations um so to speak so ultimately it all comes down to be the same it just you know making slight tweaks there but all the components that we're showing you. These are the core components for um, your typical quest. And then all we've done is put this into an even bigger, like Russian uh, nesting doll <laughs> that ends up being a 120, 150 page book. So, uh, is this yeah. Is this adventure just a bunch of quests? Always was. Yeah. Always was, Sarge. <laughs> Always was, Sarge. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he can't help you. Not with the cursed mummy hand. All right. So let's go into key locations, uh, make sure that we finish up our slides, and then, then we'll make sure we do lots of question time at the end. Um, this one, it, interestingly, I don't think it's as complicated as last week, but it does. it is a little bit longer. All right, key location always refers to a location on the map that's numbered or marked with a letter. Uh, so typically, you will see a key locations, uh, say, like, the following locations are key to the map on page, blah, blah, blah. And so, like, if you look at Ravenloft, like or look at a, a curse of Strahd, it'll be like in chapter k i'm pretty sure it's k for <laughs> castle ravenloft uh it'll be like the following locations are keyed to the upper floor of castle ravenloft uh the you only need to describe a key location if the location this is so important <laughs> if the location possesses features that are inherently different than what you noted in the general features section Otherwise, you should avoid detailing the key location as it may be redundant. Common, common examples of things that you don't have to describe include empty closets, small hallways, devoid of any kind of encounter, and, and empty rooms. Um, I would probably go as far to say, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much covers it. So anything that doesn't, an area that doesn't have anything going on, especially a small area, if there's nothing you don't for need the to label. players to discover there, there's nothing you really need to write yeah. there. I would make an exception for a large area because all you're going to do is make the GM look at the map and go, how come this one isn't labeled? 
but like small like hallways for example you'll if you go through a lot of books you'll see that hallways are rarely ever labeled and described because it's just a hallway you know it's just connecting um one area to the next same with like a closet you'll just have like a tiny closet you don't need to describe what's in it you know that's just where they keep that's just where Stroud keeps his lysol ain't nobody gotta know what else is in there <laughs> but I couldn't so get this Strahd was my... hoarding all of the lysol <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to keep the place too. I'm, I too am worried about COVID. <laughs> I don't want to lose my sense of smell. <laughs> That's how I'm going to run. Chris Estrada. <laughs> You're not even ready for that. He's going to be like Rob playing. Schneider. Rob I'm Schneider is. If I have to deal with that. <laughs> Kevin James is Strahd. <laughs> it's going to be on one of those. All right. All right, yeah, yeah. It's serious time, folks. This is a serious stuff. We got to give the people this very much important information. Yes, this <laughs> is really important. This is not. Um, this is implicit, so there, you don't actually break it up like this. But the format of a location, there's actually a design within the design to show you how a location should be formatted, and this is more or less how it should be organized. First, obstacles. Does anything prevent the characters from entering the location? For example, is the only door that leads there locked? Then you want to make sure that's the first thing you put, because if you don't put that as the first thing, you're going to have a DM who's going to read all the other details and then get to the fact that it's locked and go, oh, shit, I wasn't supposed to read all that to you guys. <laughs> so you put that at the top so you know that it prevents him from doing it. You might also do that with like, like a trap that's right there or like you know like maybe there's immediately encounter before they open the door in fact it happens so fast you can't even see what's inside it okay so anything that would be an immediate obstacle not necessarily all encounters would be there but definitely uh traps on the door itself leading into it um if the door is locked anything like that is pretty important next broad features what are the things that are immediately noticeable in the area? The passive features. You might address these within the read aloud text block again. So two and three here on this list are actually where the text block really comes to play. So those broad features again are those passive features. You enter a lavishly decorated uh, bedroom that has a four post bed with um, multi pink comforter on top. There. I mean, I've, I've just in that one line, I've kind of described all I really need for the room. You don't have to go crazy on the details there. A few well-placed adjectives are worth a lot more than way too much descriptive text. Um, and keep in mind, too, the, D, you, the DM is your co-storyteller. So the more you describe, the more you take away from them as a storyteller. Next, also within a read aloud, obvious clues. What obvious clues do you want to make sure the DM points out to the characters? These should almost always be addressed within read aloud text block as you want to make sure that the DM doesn't miss it. For example, like you turn the corner and you see that the hallway has collapsed. There is a skeleton trapped underneath one of the boulders, its face locked in a horrific scream. Five feet from the skeleton lies a silver amulet with a red gem in the middle of it, right? You put that in there because you know what that is that's bait <laughs> but you want to make sure that it gets described so you put that in the read aloud text block and you want to make sure that obvious clues are put in there also any kind of telegraphing that you would want to put so you could say here's a classic one there is a large stalactite in the middle of this cavern and there are a number of animal bones surrounding it anybody who's played D, &D long enough is going to be like i don't trust that stalactite like might excuse me it's mites are up tights are down but yeah <laughs> you're gonna see you're they're gonna know it's probably a roper so if you want to telegraph stuff that's a place to put it too and telegraphing is really really important as a dm because it's not your job well we'll have probably have a more philosophical discussion about this later but eat too long didn't read that's where obvious clues go once you get past the areas that are that kind of go into the read aloud text box. So I would say your obstacles generally go above your read aloud. Your read aloud comes next, has your broad features and obvious clues. Then your DM notes. Basically, what should the DM know about the location that you don't want the characters slash players to know about? This could be anything from like, if the players are too loud coming into this room, they're going to alert the people next door. Um, anything that, that sh they should know that um, kind of doesn't have a place within the rest of these um, sections that I'm describing. I can also give background on the place itself. But again, it's like backstory. You, like 
this is this is kind of a joke you'll see like with old dungeon magazines um because they were fluffing up the word count they would go and describe like a room like this was once a gorgeous ballroom where hundreds of people from all over the land would come and dance and eat you know broiled pig and blah 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 but now it's just empty and full of cobwebs it's like why did all that other stuff matter <laughs> so only put in really what matters um because again our job is to make it concise um if somebody's paying you by word and they don't know any better go for it but <laughs> for your own people and the benefit of your own uh, customers if you want to do this professionally definitely only keep what you need in there um next triggered effects these are any things that happen once the characters enter the room or do anything uh specific that would trigger an effect uh an encounter for example you know there's just an orc sitting there chilling eating a sandwich you know that's a good time to put him in so he can be like what what are you doing here you know or if they move past you know that's big block with the x on it on the map they fall into a pit that's when you put the triggered effects in so as you can see you're kind of moving from um obstacles to passive getting closer to more active um features of it and that's when we kind of finally come into finally is hidden details what things can the characters discover through active participation should include things not immediately noticeable within the broad features as well. uh, and it should also include secret things uh, usually i put the treasure around this point so any treasure that would be gained would show up here and followed by any secrets that would show up like secret doors is usually one of the last things that i put in there anything that's particularly hard to find would go into that hidden detail section so that is more or less the structure of your location it's really important to do it that way because like i said you don't the dm is going to read it from you know they're a western reader they're going to read it from top to bottom and what they what is generally called an f pattern which means people read websites and everything they pretty much read they read over down go a little bit over down and so forth until they grok as much information so make sure your obstacles stop them from anything the read aloud gives all the information that the players need and then so on and so forth and those bold and italicies that's when they really start showing up is when they start coming into the uh the triggered effect you usually will separate those out like encounter colon or eating a sandwich or trap colon pit treasure whatever the treasure is secret door whatever the secret door is those calling those individual sections out after the uh, obstacles and broad features all right i think there's only one more slide and then we're going to take questions uh venture conclusion i think we know what this is but the adventure conclusion addresses the end of the adventure should offer information on the following items what happens if the characters successfully complete the adventure quest the ideal climax but what happens if the characters fail also want to put that as well what happens to the important npcs of the adventure if they survive what happens if bone daddy gets away and shrine of the emperor bones does he go and start to have a yacht party i mean put that in there um what other rewards should the characters receive for completing the adventure quest whether they're successful or not also put that in there adventure conclusion again doesn't have to be very long a lot of this is going to be left up to your dm's interpretation uh, you can also put it um hooks for any future uh adventures and connective tissue for stuff um but yeah that's that's pretty much it Ta-da! I'll, I'll stress here for the adventure oh. conclusion because this was part of the conversation i had with one of our writers today when we were discussing this your adventure conclusion is still you doing work for the DM, not the players. You're not going to spend your adventure conclusion saying what the players need to deal with next. You're spending your adventure conclusion talking about how the NPCs have changed as a result of this adventure being completed in one way or another. Because you're again making sure that the game master is ready to move forward. Like if they've taken this class, they have the seeds of their next adventure yeah. to follow the steps and roll it all out if they want to keep going. <laughs> or it prepares the DM for where they might go next. Storm King's Thunder, for all the weird things it does, will be like, well, if they decide to go, if the if the party decides to go to this place, go to this chapter, or this place, go to this chapter. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for us. Like They return to the location and they can receive more quests from said quest giver. <clears throat> yep. But it's about making sure the game master or the DM has the tools they need to fill that out. You're not writing content for your table. You're providing a framework for an individual you don't know. Yep. Yeah, you're just pretty much telling them the, the loose ends they need. And it is a good area to like add in like ideas for adventures in case the DM doesn't really know 
what to do next. Like, um, and, and if you do have multiple, like if you're creating a series, you know, you would say, okay, now go to, you know, this part of it. Um, and you'll see a lot of that in some of our material that we read. Like speak with that is a very, like at the end of each section, it'll go proceed to chapter, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, the adventure conclusion doesn't have to be long. To put it in perspective, Rhyme of the Frostman is a 350 page book and the adventure conclusion takes up less than a full page. It's like, okay, winter is over or winter is not. Congratulations. Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, it doesn't need to say more than that. You did it. I mean, there's a secret ending. That we're, Drew we're Stewart and like high fiving you, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you did it. The Panthers like, yeah. <laughs> the end. Credits. <laughs> All right, yeah, All right, that's um, homework. Yeah, we'll, we'll go. We'll, we'll go over we'll the homework. The homework. Make sure. You sign up for the next class on formatting the adventure in GM Binder. Uh, yeah, we're going to be going over GM Binder and how to format everything to look nice and pretty for you. Uh, I I do have news which could be good or bad for some of you. I know you've probably some of you have been doing Wednesday every week. Unfortunately, because our classes are getting progressively smaller, we are not going to have. A Wednesday class next week. I know. I'm sorry. We will, of course, have videos for you. So if you absolutely can't make it to any class except for Wednesday class, we could do that. And you're free to also chat with us as normal in the class. But our classes, like each, you know, it's the way it happens. Like we're not like, oh my gosh, I can't believe people are going to the end. You know, <laughs> you you know, you half the people expect half the people that say they're going to show up show up, and then you know, each week, you know, a few people, you know, just drop off. Um, so we won't have a Wednesday class next week. We, we will have a Monday class and we'll have the Saturday at 1 p.m. class as normal, but there will be no Wednesday. As a note, if you cannot attend Monday, you can still sign up for Monday. That will give you access to the replay. You can Correct. watch it when it is more convenient for you. 100%. So yes, Sarge is exactly right. Even if you can't show up to one of those courses, the replay is infinite. You can watch it as many times as you want. You get to see this. And you also get to see this, this guy. <laughs> Most you importantly, can, like this. I said, you can, maybe this hand. <laughs> you can watch the replay. You can speak to us in the Discord. Uh, we try to be responsive when it comes to the questions. Yeah. Just don't, just don't tag us. We, yeah. we usually check it. Good. Yeah, We're tag Darian. Tag Darian. Yeah, tag Whistle Hunter. That's his yeah. job now. Well, that's his, yeah, <laughs> we we hired a CS guy. He started on Monday, so tag him. <laughs> tag the shit out of him. Uh, no, don't. For, they said they're here for the dog. Everyone's here for Lulu. Uh, you can have her. <laughs> She's my right. daughter. Um, I might give her away. Uh, yeah, I think like we talked about uh, chapter five and stocking the dungeon in the appendices of the DMG. Now that you're going to be spending the next week writing the adventure, now that you've got all the details you've gotten out, chapter five has a lot of great guidance about coming up with the flavor of your adventure that you can roll some of the stuff there and that'll tell you a lot of things you need to write down. And if you're not sure what to put in the dungeon, go to the append appendix A of the DMG. There's a very robust appendix for what goes in various dungeons of different types yep. and what goes into each room. I it use them. I still use them. I, I use them all the time. I mean, when you're writing, like, honestly, even if you know, most of the time what you want to do like those appendices can help you like really change up your writing style and come up with more um creative stuff i love random tables and i, I think you'll find as a it's a gm like when you start out you want like total control but after a while it's just like random tables are your friend you can be more flexible and if you can find random tables you can really the the campaign i ran today i mean i had a bunch of stuff planned but as i needed new things i just be like oh it's like what's this guy's name oh his name is fantasy name generators.com human name his name is bocephus <laughs> jones the third obviously and <laughs> and he's got a weird scar you know like like tamira that was all roles sorry she's coming up with her she's so weird <laughs> um she felt random rolled <laughs> i was like what is what is going on well i mean here? i took it you know I me mean, i think it the extreme <laughs> it's like i rolled like she's like like incredibly ugly and I was like, how ugly can I make someone? Hmm. Uh, Blake, I just added the link to week two on there for you. Yeah. And week three will be uploaded probably from this session. So. Yep. Yep. I'll probably have it up tomorrow, <laughs> if not tonight. Um, 
Next, review any current Wizards of the Coast product to get a feel for the Adventures organization. Uh, any of those, honestly, any of ours, pretty pretty much with anything we've made this year, I'd say most of last year too, are going to more or less have this format. Uh, again, I think this format is very much uh, Dungeon Magazine's format, where you had a lot of writers not necessarily writing interconnected content. If you own Tales from the Yawning Portal of Ghosts of Saltmarsh, you're going to see it in a lot of those as well. Um, Let's see. And then review chapter five and the stocking a dungeon section in appendix A, pretty much just like Sarge said. Those will tell you details on writing a nifty dungeon. Last slide, of course, you all know what it is. Become a content professional. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the nature of becoming a content professional, whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's adventure writing or map making, or honestly, it's all the same. Like, I mean, yeah, your content's different, but in terms of becoming an internet professional and making money doing stuff for a living, um, I'm pretty confident in my ability. Like, if I wanted to be the world's best kazoo player, I could probably do that. <laughs> and I'm going to impart some of that wisdom up upon you. And it'll be like this. It'll start broad and get to around, like, super detail. So I'm, I know some of y'all in that first week are like, well, this is easy. And then, like, week two, you're like, oh, no, I didn't know there was going to be math. <laughs> and then week three is like, what? What's all this? This isn't in the DMG. Ah! Um, but yeah, like uh, the content professional class would be the same. Of course, the price will keep going up until we get to the end. The only reason I'm doing that is not because we want to necessarily like, ha we got you. It's more of a, we want to keep it nice and intimate. And if we have to put up a barrier of entry to get there, great. So far, we've got about 100-ish people signed up for it, um, which is awesome because um, we're going to, we've got a class uh, classroom that we're going to have and I'm going to start already giving out like uh, books and stuff like that or not books but give you recommended reading and we're going to start talking about some of the pre stuff so we'll be having some build up to that as well uh, and then that will be with me more involved more of me involved more of this and that but more of this uh, <laughs> um, but yeah uh, the offers back up there I think we will spend the next 25 minutes now all and right, we're going to start with Gooch's question because it was a good one, but uh, we needed to get to the flow of this because this is more of a design question. Yep. How do you determine the value of the reward for completing an adventure? Is there a GP formula per level? Yep. My there. favorite tool Dave introduced, if you want to talk about your treasure hoard as an inventory. Approach. What do you mean? So he held up Xanathar's Guide. Xanathar's Guide gives very good guidance about how many treasure hoard rolls the party should get over the course of the game. Dave likes to basically presume that like in a typical one shot where they're going to maybe cover about half the ground they're going to need to level up anyway, he will put a treasure hoard roll within that adventure by using it as an inventory. He'll do a treasure hoard roll from the, from the treasure tables. Yep. And then he that's an inventory of rewards within the adventure. Yeah. And he'll split them out where it feels appropriate. Mm -hmm. Some of it's in the adventure hook, some of it's in the conclusion, some of it's in the various rooms or on the NPCs. Yep. Like if the MP like if you roll out the party gets like a plus one weapon. Oh, one of the creatures in the adventure is holding a plus one weapon and it's right. gonna give somebody a bad time. <laughs> yeah and, and really <laughs> The thing with treasure too, you'll find a lot in design is that it's it's the value of the treasure is usually directly proportionate to how difficult uh, it was to find it, whether it's hidden away like in a secret spot, it's like well guarded with traps and stuff or monsters. It's very rare that you just, you know, you open up Strahd's Lysol closet and you find like, oh, well, all this treasure's right here. What the hell are we doing going through this castle? You know, <laughs> you know, you have to find that stuff at the end. But I mean, that's that's pretty much, I would say, common sense. Um, but yeah, that's that's ultimately the way to do it. If you're writing a fourth level adventure, go to the DMG, um, whatever chapter it is for treasure, like six or seven. Um, look at those treasure hoard tables, roll it randomly. I think for zero through four, it's like 2,000 gold pieces. Um, and then just really look at Xanathar's Guide on page... Uh, oh God, I can't even remember what it is. I'd say it's it's in this chapter, but there's only three chapters in Xanathar. Another example of like there's not a lot chapters aren't used very often um, in the books, uh, but yeah, it breaks it all down in a easy to miss uh, text block. Damn it, where is it? It's at the. Oh, let me pull up on D&D. Here it is. Ah, I found it. One 
page 135. It's in the awarding magic item section. It says behind the design magic item distribution. Seven rolls on challenge zero through four table. Eight rolls on five through 10, 12 rolls to 11 through 16. I think once I'm done with this, Sarge, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make a spreadsheet and post it on Patreon like I did with the skill DCs. I think that that's a good it. one. I think it would help because I have to have a conversation with the writers today about too many items. Yeah. That were rewarding in one of their adventures. Yeah. Griff, Griff is uh, really bad about that. When we do Team Super Hydra, he'll be like, here's nine things that I want in this. I'm like, nine things? This is the adventure of that. Ain't that long, man. They're just fighting some bullywugs. <laughs> like, what's a, a bullywug all be decked out in gold? <laughs> like eight magic right. items. The bullywug right. is wearing all. Th- the bullywug's wearing all three of those uh, those items he had that come together <laughs> and form a set. Like you can all, you only get three attunement slots, bullywug. Like, Stands well, out there. It's the champion bullywug. <laughs> He's here to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a bullywug though because they're not SRD Sark. Oh, it'd be Buffonum. <laughs> It'd be frog folk. That's a frog folk. Uh, they're frog folk. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, let's see. We had some other questions. CJ asked us, any advice for writing in wilderness adventures? Could you use a different map for an outdoor location instead of rooms in the dungeon? Hey, that's a great idea. That's a great question. And all a wilderness location is, is just a dungeon with no walls. <laughs> it's true. Yep. You might want a regional map so your party has a sense of where they're going and maybe yeah. they can hex crawl their way around yep. to find some stuff. Yep. But yeah. Yeah, just just recognize your distances between things. Um, the typical party in non-difficult terrain can travel on average of about 24 miles a day. So you don't want to have everything be like a day apart. Otherwise, you're essentially rewriting Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, <laughs> but like if it's like, like Barovia is a perfect example of like, you know, essentially when you start getting to regional maps, it's like that Russian nesting doll, right? A regional map is just a bigger dungeon with many dungeons within it, right? Is it, does that make sense? So if you look at the map of Barovia and Curse of Strahd, if you walk over it, like in an old fan, Final Fantasy video game, it's like, bloop, 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 and now you're in a smaller area, but it's all the same, right? And then you could say that, like, um, there are three styles of non-dungeon maps described in the Dungeon Master's Guides, and those are regional provincial and continental i think i can't remember in other words it's like one hex equals three miles one hex equals oh god i think it's one six and sixty are the different um average distances they say for stuff but in this case you would do like one hex equals one mile if you wanted to do um a wilderness area or even like you could do it even smaller than that like uh, like 500 one hex equals 500 feet you know something like that but it's it's ultimately still just a dungeon you're just your keyed encounters become um not necessarily like locations but you just do it the same way you number them that's where they you know if they get there that's when they hit it here's a description of what's there uh what's a good example of this thunder tree from Fandolin is a good example of that because it's it's wide open space right they can kind of go anywhere that they want um instead of like specifically just you know wandering through doors and whatnot that's a good question though let's see james asked us about the slides i've linked those for him yep. brandon asked us do you have any advice on making plot points not feel forced like the characters falling through a floor that gives way um it depends. I mean, Shrine of Tamachon is a classic adventure, and that's exactly how it starts. <laughs> you know, you're just wandering around, and all of a sudden you're in a place that's got green mist all over it. Um, you know, I think there's a certain suspension of disbelief that most at least experienced characters know to adapt with um, D&D. And even if it feels a little forced, it's kind of like that unwritten agreement, like they can do it. If you're worried about that, though, you can telegraph stuff. And that's the importance of telegraphing, especially like certain dangerous things. I would say the more dangerous something is going to be in the game to the players and their total resources, the more you need to make it obvious that it can, it can hurt you. So a trap that is um, could one-shot somebody, you need to really make it clear ahead of time 
that this is what this trap could potentially do. Now you could pot, you could do that probably with higher level people because they're like, oh, we have to revive them, you know. But if you do that with the first level party, they're gonna they ain't gonna be your friend. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's what you meant. Um, just it it all it is always gonna come down to depends on what it is and when it needs to happen. Players are usually very accommodating. So long as you've given them enough of a sense of what the purpose and the goal is, yeah. players will usually accommodate you on the goal. Or they'll just say, we're just not feeling that. Yeah, like we, had, we did that once when we were playing a Ducky's game. There was a very stupid quest that was given to us in um, one of the later sections of the Dragon of Icefire Peak series. Sorry to the writer of that quest. Uh, but the quest that involves going back to Thalavar's tower to go into the ethereal plane felt ill-advised to our characters, and we commented on that for the entire time, even though we ran it because Ducky didn't have anything else prepped. Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely some adventures that feel like the plot point is forced. Like a Tomb of Annihilation again has a lot of good ideas, but I mean, ultimately, when you come down to it, then the adventure hook is like a wealthy woman who's like, "Uh, I don't feel good. I will give you a magic item if you can help me." Like it's like. Okay. <laughs> when do we get this? Oh, when you're done defeating the lich and its unborn evil god. Uh, then I'll give Henry you a, a, a common good. magic item off my shelf. You know, it's like Henry has a good question for us. He's yeah. They ask, uh, are hex crawls useful for wilderness adventures? So yeah. Specific locations, but each unmarked lo hex has a chance for random stuff. Hex hexes are ultimately it's just a all about a little bit more choice because instead of moving up, down, left, right. Now you can move six different directions. <laughs> um, I think a hex crawl is at its best when it's linking a lot of quests together and it culminates in a sandbox wide quest. Yeah. Like Rhyme does a good job of that, sorta, with the chapter four stuff. Yeah. Where the region is being threatened by a very powerful existential threat. And the party needs to use their knowledge of the region to determine what's the most effective way for them to intercept this threat to try to protect the region. I want to—I don't want to spoil that section in case people get to it. But yeah. that's kind of when—that's kind of where I think having a hex crawl matters. Is there's no reason to give the party a bunch of travel rules they need to focus on if there is not going to be a dramatic reason for being proficient in your travel rules. Yeah, I think. <clears throat> hex crawls could be effective if they don't feel really tedious um, and you have interesting things that could randomly happen in them. Like Ghosts of Saltmarsh have some really cool rules for travel and basically what would be sea hex crawling because you can get random boats, which can make things really interesting. You could get like a random island, which is really cool. You know, it's like, oh, we just stumbled upon an, an island ruled by an abolith. You know, it's bizarre, but it's it's interesting. But like Tomb of Annihilation, for example, you're really just going to encounter like random horrible monsters and you're going to be doing like three to four sessions of it and it can just get kind of tiresome. I think the best that I've seen is honestly Curse of Strahd's really nice other than the fact that it's very like linear. It's not really a hex crawl because you're, you're, all, you're going around the mountain most of the time. So it's all just, you know, it's kind of like I'm going to go here to here to here to here and then back. Um, Rhyme kind of has an uh, um, problem that's a little bit different than like everything's condensed like in the beginning very much around 10 towns but like it's not really a hex crawl because you're really just going like all right we're gonna go up here i'm gonna go back i'm gonna go here i'm gonna go back i'm gonna go here <laughs> you know it's just like going point to point not really like wandering around trying to see if you can find different things because frankly there's just a whole lot of nothing within it's <laughs> like it's like uh, what's the what, yeah it's just like arctic terrain forever uh, and you really are just kind of like slingshotting back and forth between basically going along the coast of these places That's and the insane. mountains. Yeah. Eric asked us, uh, how do you handle encounter XP budgeting when the plan is for a, a creature to retreat from the first encounter, but fight to the death in a later encounter? Do we include it in the XP math of the final encounter or the initial one or both? Uh, it really, it really is going to depend again on, is it going to do damage? when is it doing is it doing damage the first time or is it just running away if it's just running away um like unless the characters find a way to box it in um it i wouldn't really even call it like a full-fledged encounter right because mo an encounter or combat encounter should probably take between three rounds 
or in, in ideally would take between three rounds. So if you're designing it, so it's just like the orc eating a sandwich. And he's like, oh, I'm out of here. You know, nothing but like a sandwich and like a dust cloud shaped like the orc left where he was. That's not really an encounter. It's just kind of like a, a, a feature. But then obviously when you fired him, you want to count that in. So I would say it just it just ultimately is going to depend. So like in the adventure, uh, one adventure I wrote, um, there is an encounter. I'm not telling him what it is because Sarge is playing in that game. Cover you, Sarge. Turn, take your headset. Head head <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's an encounter that's pretty hard, but there's enough telegraphing to tell you, don't go down that hall. You're going to get killed. If you go down there, that's not our fault. And it's, uh, okay, you're good, Sarge. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like like even though even though that would add like like if you were to fight that thing it would add 700 so if it's something you don't intend in the fight you don't really have to encounter put it into your, your math eric mentioned that the griffin will do one attack and then fly away look man if the creature is going to attack the party it's going to die because players yep. do not like getting hit if the creature is going to commit any activity to fighting them it's not going to survive the encounter because the party is not going to let a creature that hits them survive yeah. the encounter. Yeah, we got about <laughs> we got about five minutes left, so um, let's see if we can get a few more questions. But these are all great hey, questions. You guys have questions. I'm going to make sure you guys have a link to the Discord. Dave and I'll hang out for a little bit tonight. Um, I might eat. I might eat something while I'm on the phone. Sorry. Oh, I hate when he does that. They just choose directly in the microphone. I'm going to open the bag like right up there. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and ask uh, some questions and see if we can, especially those of you who would be able to listen in, get your questions in first. Hey, sir. I don't know. Eric's asking a really complex question about how do you account for encounter math. I'd probably make he asked a question about like the the party's charging a stronghold. This is a little more complex than the standard uh, encounter math can account for. I'd probably want to set up <clears throat> the the features that are threatening them, like people throwing javelins or stings at them, kind of like a hazard, so you can account for it that way and use the DMG's guidance on a hazard, like once per round on initiative count ten. Every creature that's not under full cover must make a dexterity saving throw, taking like 2d6 damage on a, on a failure, half as much on a success. That's probably the way I'd probably go about that, just so you you can make it dramatically significant. Like, oh, geez, we're going to die if we stay here, but not mm -hmm. like they're going to have to commit a ton of resources on that part. Or you could make them commit a ton of resources if that's what you're going for. Yeah. Uh, but I review the guidance in the DMG about how to use hazards for what you're describing there. Yeah, like, when I, I personally, when it starts getting up to too many mobs in a single encounter, you'll see in a lot of my my current writing is that I um, start automating it because it gets really tedious. Um, when Like, if you, it's, it's like cool it's like, initially my thing, like, whoa, what if they, 20th level characters fought 100 goblins, you know, it's like, well, do you want to roll for every single one of those goblins or does it make more sense to treat them as one large hazard, which, you know, 20 level characters have to like, go, go away. <laughs> uh, oh, Roxanne actually has an interesting question. If the PCs come into a room that only has three foot height, so they have to fight, do they, so they have to fight prone unless they're say a small race, like a gnome. You adjust difficulty. So again, the, the chapter three on, on generating encounters basically says, if you give the enemy a tactical advantage, increase the encounter difficulty by one step. Mm -hmm. So if it's currently an easy encounter, make it medium. If it's a medium encounter, make it hard. If it's hard, make it deadly. Yeah. You can adjust, you can give like your encounter some wiggle math and just increase the XP value to make it deadly TM as part of your encounter budgeting because that kind of stuff is harder to calculate yeah. as such, but just account for harder XP. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Annie Louvatar is asking us what are great examples of payoff rewards or consequences or adventure conclusions that make PCs feel good at the end? Um, let them be like in charge of stuff or give them like cool shit. Players love cool shit. It's all about the dopamine. All about uh, <laughs> you know, you really got to make sure that you're adding, you're giving them something that, you know, it, it, 
D and D is very much about gaining levels, right? And I think that's probably what's made it the most successful system ever. It's because the the path to progression is very clear. It's not like Call of Cthulhu. Where it's where like I'm better at reading books now. You know, <laughs> when you're done with an adventure, literally, that's something you you can get. You know, there's no levels, there's no hit dice, but in there, it's this. So any anything that adds up to that, which makes him feel a little bit more powerful, is is going to be a meaningful reward. You just want to make sure you don't want to do too much. All right, I think we got. 55 seconds left so this is going to be our goodbyes and we'll just you, i would love to answer all the questions but um goodbye to you all let me wave goodbye with my uh brandon ask us the question in the discord and we'll see if we can get that answered for yeah you. we'll see y'all we love you thank you all guys we can't tell you enough we we love you so much for coming to these these are a lot of fun we hope that this information is useful we all hope that you write some killer adventures to the point where we have to make you actually fight with knives um <laughs> like oh you're all too good you know just like the joker just hand you a knife like all right there's just took there's, back to there's like a job the weird, the weird season of yu yu haku show oh 10 <laughs> seconds edge, oh we're match. all gonna explode <laughs> ah, ah, have a good night everyone i'm a stapler <laughs> oh no jesus christ <laughs>